Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creative Live. I'm Kenna Klosterman, your host, and I am so excited to kick off 2021 with all of you, wherever it is that you're tuning in from. Uh, from all of us here at Creative Live, we are thrilled to head into a brand new year and hope that you all are doing well and excited to keep creating in 2021 because that is what keeps us all sane. Um, let me know where it is before we get started that you are tuning in from. We love to do all of those shout outs. So whether you are tuning in on Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, or right here on the Creative Live page, creativelive.com slash TV. Type in there where you're tuning in from. Let me know how you're doing. Let me know what you're excited about in 2021, and we will get those shout outs going. Uh, so today we have another episode, our first episode of the year with our dear friend and educator, Ms. Julia Kelleher. And I couldn't be more excited to bring her on Creative Live for all of you, as well as this is our podcast, We Are Photographers, where we connect you with photographers, filmmakers, and creative industry greats all over the world. We talk about real life, the ups and the downs of being a creative, living in that creative life, so that you guys know that none of us are alone in our creative journey. So once again, I'm super excited to bring on Julia Kelleher. She is a portrait and fine art photographer. She is a Nikon ambassador, and she runs an incredibly profitable studio in her hometown of Bend, Oregon. She has been educating uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of students all over the world, whether that is right here on Creative Live, through her own educational platform, whether it's in person on the Nikon stages all over the world, or wherever it is in person. So she's got a podcast, she's got Jewel TV, and <laughs> she is just a beautiful human being. Please help me welcome on Julia Kelleher. Julia, thank you for being our first guest of 2021. Oh my God, you make me sound so good. <laughs> Can I just have you in my mirror every day when the, you know, the inner critic is like pounded on you? Thank you for that warm welcome, Kenna. That was very cool. I appreciate it. And I'm excited to be here. Well, great. Um, and yes, I'm happy to be on that shoulder where you've got uh, George. Is that his name? George. Yes. <laughs> remember George. Shoulder. Um, I, I, I was thinking this morning, what was his, her inner critic's name? George. We'll get there. We're going to get there. We'll get there. <laughs> Uh, anyway, Howard, just to kick, I'm going to kick it off uh, before we start our conversation. Again, going back to seeing where people are tuning in from. Um, we love those shout outs. We've got Happy New Year from Janice. We have Tara in Kent, the UK. We have Latvia. We have Los Angeles, London, Malta. Wow. How wow. cool is that? That is uh, so cool. What time Tom is it Tom in Seattle. I don't know. What time is it in Malta, Mario? <laughs> uh, we have Tina. We have Helen in Estonia. Lindsay in Saskatchewan. Calgary. I mean, this is wow. just, this is my favorite part, is connecting with people all over the world. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank technology is amazing, isn't it? It really is. Oh, so cool. So Julia, and keep those coming in, folks. And if you, again, if you are on creativelive.com slash TV, you can also uh, join the chat room and be chatting with each other and me in there too. Okay, Julia, it's 2021. What are you most excited about just in terms of your life right now? And, you know, it's been a, it's been a challenging 2020 uh, I know a lot of people, especially creatives, entrepreneurs, um, just humans in general, uh, have had a tough time. But before we got in this call, you were like, I am excited to let everybody know 2021 is going to be great. So tell me more. <laughs> it is. It just has to be different. I mean, there's, you know, there's only, there has to be a way up, right? I mean, 2020 was rough on me. My sessions were down. Things were tight. Uh, some beautiful things happening is we built a, a new home and after two years of construction, we finally got to move in. So that was kind of a wonderful personal um, achievement in 2020. So, you know, there was ups and downs. And I think the biggest thing is I just did my like goal planning sheets for last for this year. And part of that process is to go back to 2020 every month, list my achievements and list, okay, what was good in 2020 every month that I'm really proud of. And I went back and looked at the list and I'm like, well, dang, I actually accomplished quite a bit. It wasn't that bad. You know, it's like, it's, you have to remind yourself we're so conditioned for that negative 
we're so conditioned to listen to the negative for that survival mechanism that I think it's really important to go back and look at the positive. So you, cause you know, you can't grow a, a business without the right mindset. You know, I'm a big believer that, um, mindset feeds or starves your business. And so it's, that's half of what you have to control. And so doing that kind of goal planning was, was super helpful. And, you know, it kicks you off in the new year and you just get kind of pumped. You're like, okay, fresh start. Let's do this. Let's do this. You do it. <laughs> wow. There's a lot, there's a lot to unpack right in everything <laughs> you just talked about. Uh, so what is, what, what, first of all, yes, I highly encourage everybody to pause, take a moment, pat yourself on the back for yes. not only getting through 2020, but looking at <laughs> you know, the beautiful things that did happen uh, through throughout the year. And I think it's interesting you break it down month by month because like chunking those things out, you know, whether it's thinking about what's happened or what's to come really makes things more achievable, right? Right, totally. And I have it in my little bullet journal here. And I like have a list of both personal and um, personal and professional achievements. And I listed them out. And you you'd be surprised at like how much it, gives you like this little, I didn't do as much personal, but like, there's my little goal sheet. And I wrote it down and I, I know half of this is podcast and half this is visual, but when you list your professional and your personal goals month by month, all of a sudden you're like, dang, it wasn't so bad. Like I did yeah. it. I actually made it through, which of course gives you confidence that you'll be able to do it again this year, even better, you know? Absolutely. So what's on the top of the personal list for this um, year? Let's get personal. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I competed in Pacific Coast sectional championships back in February before COVID hit, and I won my division. Which was of? Like ice skating, figure skating. Sorry, not I should have said that. Yes. No, <laughs> not everybody knows your, I'm, your I'm, past. I'm okay, so like, let's go I'm there. Like, as a figure skater. Because <laughs> this is the fun part. I love when I first met you, and I can visualize the two of us in the Creative Live studio, like, doing some social media tweets and having you, like, twirl around and... <laughs> So, so let's dive back into the life of Julia, because this is the fun stuff to, to, to get to where you are today. Okay. So a couple of things I want to talk about, but let's start with okay. ice skating. Sure. Uh, how, why, when, what for how heck? long? Yes. What the are heck? And I didn't realize you were still competing. Yeah. So I started actually skating. Well, recreationally as a kid, you know, every Friday it's, I grew up in Switzerland. So every Friday we would go to the rink at lunchtime and we would skate around. It's like so unofficial, no training, no lessons, no nothing. Well, and then at 30, when I moved to Portland, Oregon and started working for the ABC, ABC affiliate there, I was a broadcaster for many years. Um, I saw the kids skating on a, in the mall rink, like at the, at the like shopping mall rink. And I was like, I need to do that. I want to do that so bad. And I, felt like such an idiot out there with the kids, this 30 year old woman, like skating around, you know, <laughs> making a fool out of herself. But I loved it so much. I'm like, screw this. I'm just going to do it. And so I started taking lessons and I got into the genre called uh, ice dancing, which is basically ballroom dancing on ice, tangos, waltzes, foxtrot, quick steps, you know, all those kinds of things you see on dancing with the stars can get translated over onto the ice. And so I found a partner and we went to the, we competed on the adult circuit. So there's a huge world for people who are 21 and over and you get divided by your age group and you can compete. So we competed in an ice dancing at the top level. We won nationals twice um, and had a great time. So they have a whole adult national championships. And, you know, we look at these young Olympic skaters with awe because there's no way you will ever get me doing like a triple flip, forget it. Um, <laughs> But I am working on my axle, which is a one and a half revolution jump. Uh, and then from there, a double sow cow. So, <laughs> you know, well, maybe someday I'll get there. <laughs> but it's a it's a great sport. It's a whole body workout. It keeps me healthy. You know, I've had a whole lot of health issues in the last couple of years that I've been struggling with. And I found that, you know, keeping up a good just an exercise and a sport that I love and meditating and trying to keep my brain in the right spot has been the single biggest, uh, you know, priority and way to move forward without like just to keep your stress level down. I mean, yeah, we have so much bombarding at us with technology and social media and all this just BS that flies at us at hundred miles an hour that we think we need to look at and take part in when the reality is it's so unhealthy for us. And it took me a while to finally figure that out. And in doing so, um, it's made me just more focused at work, more successful, more able to prioritize more able to focus on single projects and get them done. 
you know, so many times we get distracted by things uh, in our work. And, and, and I still go through those unmotivated stages, man. December, I was like, no, no, don't want to work. Don't want to do anything. Just let me sit in my bed and do nothing and sit there and watch TV all day. That was me. I mean, <laughs> it's a balance, right? I yes. mean, it's a balance of do, learning how to do flips through the air and on an ice skating rink and <laughs> to sitting, you know, and allowing yourself to to sit there and watch TV for a day and that being okay. Right. Uh, but what I, what I love is you talking about mindset um, and mindset whether that's in the personal realm and the professional realm. And it, it just visualizing you on the, on the, you know, ice dancing means that you do have to be so focused. And, and is that a meditation for you? You know, is that a, yeah, I mean, talk to me about the psychological part of that type of intensity in terms of focus. I think anytime you have a hobby, a sport, something that you love that can take your mind away from the rest of the world, that is a meditation of sorts. Um, and for me, it happened to be figure skating. And I'm just always learning something new on the ice that I really don't feel like I'm exercising, which to me is great. Like, I cannot run a mile to save my life. I would die of boredom, for one. Number two, I would probably die of exhaustion as well. But you put me on a rink and I can skate around no problem. And it's just, I really think that getting some kind of passion outside of your business is so critical to keeping that balance. And it's critical to keeping your mindset in the right place. And sometimes I have to literally force myself in the middle of the day and go, Julia, go to the rink, go skate. I have to, and I feel so guilty. I'm like, oh, my students need me. My clients need me. I can't, I can't. And then I'm like, nope. You will not be anything for them if you don't take care of yourself first. And that's, I mean, that is really what it comes down to. Self-care is the secret. It is. And, and allowing yourself to prioritize that even when it's, you know, even when you don't want to do it. But when you, like you said, finding something that you do love so that you do want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, so, I don't, I'm not a runner. I'm not an ice skater. <laughs> I'm not an ice dancer. I'm not a, but I love to go out and walk in nature. And for a long time, I beat Perfect. myself up of just like, oh, going for long walks is not exercise. And there was this class on Creative Live where there was a, you know, an, an instructor who was talking about health and was like, no, if that's your chosen, like that is exercise. That is okay. You okay, know, we okay, gotta... okay. Wait, wait, wait. Hold the presses. Stop here. Okay. Kenna, it's, it's you time, tiger time. Like it's, you know, and I meditate every morning and evening for 10 minutes and that's me time as well. My skating time is me time. I think people need to shift their mindset to that me time is really you time. The only reason me, Julia, is able to be here with you, Kenna, and be engaged in this interview and focused and giving as much of myself as I can is because I have taken time for me to repair me, to relax my mind, to grow my health, exercise, whatever it might be. It's that passion. I have shut out the world, shut out social media, and focused only on me. And in doing so, that gives me enough to give to you. And so your walks are just that. They're kind of time so that you can give to the rest of us. And you're so amazing at it. <laughs> you're so cute. But uh, thank you. No, it's, um, it is it is encourage everybody to find that thing for you, uh, oh, especially, again, at the beginning of the year. Uh, and just to, you know, new year, new you. It just It is an opportunity to pause and prioritize Great, great I, book out there. Yes, if you please. if you keep like, because you know how you make these New Year's resolutions, like you want to yes. do things. A great book to help you stick with it and like learn to habitualize is a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. Oh my gosh, yep. love that book. It really taught me how to be productive in a very systematic, step by step way. Absolutely, highly recommend. A hundred percent. Thank you for for giving that shout out. Atomic Habits, everyone, if you missed that. Um, let's talk about, you You mentioned earlier, 
uh, the critic, the inner critic. <laughs> so I want to go, I, I want to go again, back in time. Part of this podcast is getting to know, uh, the, the human behind the, the artist and, and, and entrepreneur, um, you know, you talk about this in your in your different creative life classes, and you know, on your podcast, and and all of that. But t- talk to us. Let's get real. Talk to us about what George means to you, and and who he is, and um and and how you've had to overcome maybe an example of of overcoming that inner critic and sort of extremes from like where you were to where where you got to. Oh my gosh. <laughs> How long do you have? <laughs> all right. Um, well, first of all, I, I really truly believe that everyone has that inner critic. And what, um, you know, I've named mine. I named him George because by doing that, it helped me kind of compartmentalize him and realize that the voice that he talks to me in my head with isn't me. It's, it's a survival mechanism. You know, we're so, we have 400 million years of evolution that has in our brain Uh, that back part of our brain wants us to survive more than anything, more than be successful in business, more than go for a run or a figure skate or whatever. And so that conditioning is so strong that we as human beings are trained to go to the negative. We are constantly nipping at ourselves because it's your brain wants you to survive. It's trying to protect you. And so I have had to come to terms with the fact that George is just trying to protect me. Yep. But I also realize that if George, if I can actually hear George in my head, like if I can hear that in a critic, that means there's two of me. There's me, my soul's voice, my creativity, my love, my positivity, my light. And then there's George, the other side of me, who is not really me because I can watch him. I can listen to him. I can hear him, which means he's really not part of me. And so in, to help me kind of get through what George says to me, I mean, he is brutal, brutal. You shouldn't be unmotivated. Everyone's counting on you. What are you doing sitting here on the couch? You're focusing more on your home than your students right now. Get your butt out of bed and go to work. You're not making enough money. You're not good enough. You suck. No one's hiring you right now because your work is getting stale. I mean, the, the comments that fire in my head are absolutely downright mean. I would never say that to a friend ever. I would never say that. I mean, even if I thought it, I wouldn't say it. You know, you would encourage someone to like, okay, well let's, you know, let's grow, let's do this, you know. Um, you know, I'm, I'm known for my students for being pretty blunt and, and straightforward, but at the same time, I'm not gonna be downright mean, a bully. George is a bully. And uh, it's, it's devastating at times. I mean, there's times when, you know, I had such a good session and the client was like, oh, we're going to buy this three set series. It was going to be like a $5,000 order. And I was so excited. And then they get to the sales room and they're like, oh, we just want one. And I'm like, oh God, really? Like, really? And it, it just deflates your balloon. And from there, it's nothing but a waterfall, a waterfall down into the pit of despair and stopping it has, it has to be a practice. And the first part of that practice is recognizing that you're about to go down your kayak, down that waterfall into the deep abyss. You know, you have to recognize that that's coming and go, okay, I, I have a choice. I can choose to go down that waterfall and wallow in despair And, or I have a choice of saying, well, this is one client. This is one event. It's not you, it's them. You know, like, you know, when you're doing a good job, you know, when your heart's in something. And even if you did make a mistake, that's the whole part of being a business owner is to make a mistake, analyze it, figure out what happened and then repair it for the future. You know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Right? Like you got to, you got to just be aware of error and be constantly looking ahead to working on those problems. And I think that George, oh God, George, God love George. George is good for me and bad for me. I don't think I'd be where I am today without him because it pushes you and drives you. But at the same time, 
Julia, a human being, heart, soul person, has to really work hard to recognize that George is not me. George is just the voice trying to protect me. And I can listen or I cannot. And that's my choice. Whew. Preach on. Uh, ro- <laughs> roll it, Roland says. You, you know me. Sorry. Uh, you know me. I could talk forever. You just give me a subject, and it's like blah, 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 blah. no. That's that. That is precisely what we are here for, Julia. And and there's so much in there. I think the important lessons of of being able to watch, recognize the watcher. You know, recognize that the George, the critic, is not who you are. Uh, sorry, that we're human. My- I'm sorry. I'm kicking my shoes off. I'm like sweating like a beast over here. I walked into my studio this morning and the thermostat was set to like 81 degrees. And, you know, I'm 48 years old and perimenopausal and like the hot flashes are real. You know what I mean? Like, good God. So I had to take my shoes off because my feet are like sweating. So sorry. TMI. Total TMI. That's all right. That's all right. For those watching the uh, or listening to the audio, they, they you know? have no idea other than we just stuck to it. Julia. You can we edit love... that part out later. No, we keep it real. We keep it real. Uh, I just, again, I think so many important lessons in what you talked about and just kind of to reiterate that, like, you are not all the things that your your brain is telling you. And, exactly. and like you said, it's that in that awareness is to where you have the choice to hear, like, not not listen, hear, and then keep going. Um, say say hi you always put them on your shoulder you know <laughs> that George so everybody find your George name it I love the concept that you have of naming it um, to separate that out from you and who you are you know and um, one one person who really helped me do that was um, Elizabeth Gilbert and her book Big Magic yeah. that was the big one the whole creativity thing and the ideas and how to put your put your inner critic in a corner you know yes. Yes, put it away yes but it's there and that's it's okay. There, yeah, that's it's okay. That's human. That's you human. want him there. You want him there. Because if you're running across the street looking at your phone and there's a car coming, you want him to tell you that there's a car coming and to stop. Like, you know, yeah. He's 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 good. He's not all yes. all bad. Yes. Yes. It's distinguishing between the two. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is sometimes really challenging for us creatives. Yes. <laughs> so Julia, in looking at your website again and just, you know, kind of uh, seeing what the latest and greatest is in the life of Julia Kelleher, uh, I I really love uh, in your podcast, which you can tell us a little bit about, but this kind of line in the beginning about uh, turn your dreams into plans and your plans into reality. So I want to go back again and talk about, I mean, you teach people and talk to people about how to do this, but I want to turn it back around on you and, and how you got to where you are and, you know, all kind of the, the ups and downs in between. So when did your dream become photography or, yeah. you know, or a plan or, you know, let's, for people who are just getting to know you, let's talk about your broadcast career, <laughs> uh, which certainly, you know, everything leads to where we are today. So oh, you know, your ability to teach and podcast and, you know, all of those things mentor, uh, you know, certainly I'm sure helped part of that, but um, yeah, let's talk about turning dreams into plans and plans into reality. Oh, it's so true. And, and a dream won't become reality unless you make a plan. It's so, it's so true. Uh, well, first of all, Focus and Facets is my brand new podcast. We just wrapped up season one and we'll be starting to season two here in, here in February. I needed a little break. It's kind of hard. I'm, I'm sure, as you know, it's hard to start a podcast. It's a lot of, it's a lot. It's just a lot. It's all of the things, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, we teach, biz- I teach business and I'm so passionate about helping particularly women, but all, I mean, I have all kinds of students take their passion and turn it into a viable living, Uh, especially moms. And, you know, I'm a mom, I have a child, and it was hard to start a business with him at my feet. And it's, but yet not impossible. And I, I did a few things right. I did a few things wrong. And I, there's, you know me from Creative Live, there's nothing more that I enjoy than helping other women see that it's possible. And so often, you know, going back to George a little bit, we have these dreams and then George goes, but no, you can't. And usually sometimes George is another person in your life who is saying that. 
a spouse, a, a family member, friends, somebody who doubts you. And it, it makes you doubt yourself. And, you know, I had a lot of that. Um, but yeah, I started my career in journalism. I have a graduate degree from Syracuse University in broadcasting and then moved all over the country over a decade for different, for different TV news uh, career jobs. I was a meteorologist and a morning anchor for the ABC affiliate in Portland was my latest, my latest gig. Um, and I left that in 2008 and, you know, it was a cutthroat industry. It was brutal. I had a lot of idealistic views about it. You know, journalism, capital J, being the voice for the little guy, being the watchdog over government. And, you know, I'm really glad I left because journalism has very much skewed away from that. Um, and, you know, it makes me sad, but it taught me, you know, like you said, it, it, it all leads to the road you're supposed to be on. And uh, it really did because I found Creative Live through my ability to broadcast and um, the podcast, of course. But I've always been that lover of the camera, um, behind the camera, not in front of it. And so I decided to, you know, pick up a camera instead of being in front of it. And you know, my father gave me my first Nikon 8008, like SLR when I was 15, because he was a hobbyist photographer and my sister got into, and we were this little happy, you know, shutter happy family. And then my sister lost her job uh, from layoffs and she decided to open her own studio. And I thought, well, if she can do it, I can do it too. You know, the younger sister syndrome, totally. And I quit TV because I was disillusioned. I was burnt out. I was working unbelievably crazy hours, you know, overnight shifts one day, regular shift the other, and having to be happy, bumpy, you know, happy, happy hunky, go dory on the morning show, you know, hey, the weather, it's going to rain in Portland. Who would have thought? <laughs> again and again and again. And again. <laughs> oh my gosh, you know how many words I have for rain? Rain, precipitation, spritz, squirt for the dirt, drizzle. I mean, it's, there are so many different ways to say water coming out of the sky. <laughs> squirt for the dirt is a new one for me. <laughs> squirt for the dirt. But that's different than a drizzle, right? And that's different than a downpour or a deluge. <laughs> Look at you go. <laughs> hey, when you're saying the same thing over and over again, you come up with ingenious ways to say it. <laughs> But anyway, so I, I digress, but yeah, so I started, I got disillusioned and tired of it and burned out. So I decided to change careers and, you know, with my sister doing it, I had a leg up because she had done some things before me. And so I kind of knew where to go. And I got started in the, all, remember all those old forums, like I love photography and pro forum, pro forum and pro photogs. I was in there constantly. They're kind of like Facebook groups are today. And I was in there constantly and trying to build this business. I had this dream of going, you know what? I want to celebrate family and photograph. My childhood, we had, we really, even though my father was a photographer, it was a shoemaker whose kids have no shoes. Like we were not, we didn't have portraits up on the wall. And so um, I explored all kinds of things, wedding photography. You know, I, I really decided that portraits were it. And then, of course, as I began to fall in love and get married, and the whole newborn thing started to draw me. Um, and then, of course, when my son was born, that's when I fully went over to that newborn babies, kids, family, uh, family area, because I connected with it, you know? And, you know, in the beginning, oh boy, um, I sucked. <laughs> I was so bad. I was showing someone, I have a mastermind membership group, Five Carat Collective, and I was showing them some of my work from like 2009 of newborns, and it was so bad. Like, I can't even tell you, uplit, ghoul lighting, photographing from the feet forward. You know, I had no idea how to pose, no idea how to combine color. And, you know, you're so passionate about what you're doing that you almost don't care. I was in that glory day of just soaking up everything I could. Um, but it was when I had to start marketing in a new town, we moved from Portland here to Bend, that I really started getting scared. I jumped basically from having a studio and, you know, somewhat mini celebrity status from having been on the news, you know, that it made it easy to get clients to coming over here to Bend to like knowing no one, a small town, 
less than 100,000 people. I had no idea what the market was like. And I moved over here to follow my husband. And I got a studio like right away. It was the middle of the 2009 economic downfall. Like we're talking, every, this building that I'm in right now was like 20% occupied. They were slated to be torn down, but I got the space anyway. I sunk 15 grand, my entire savings account to fix it up because I had to, because the landlord wasn't going to put any money into it. And I tried to open like right before Christmas. <laughs> Dumb move. <laughs> yeah. Like February, I couldn't pay my rent. Like I had $200 in my bank account. I could not pay my rent. I had a thousand dollar rent bill coming up and I thank God had paired up with the humane society and was photographing dogs and pets and managed to get some sales from that, a big display. And, and that launched things quickly. And I went from having nothing in my bank account to $40,000 in like two months. And from doing all these sales and stuff from this display that I had gotten. And uh, so that's finally what kicked it off. And I was able to grow my business by having that nice chunk of money in the bank and to go from there. But yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things I preached to my students that I did early on was build yourself that nest egg, build yourself that, that savings account, because like this pandemic, I have, you know, two years with the operating expenses in the bank. Yeah. I've had a lot of red months in the last year, but I'm okay because I have that nest egg. And so if, you know, and the, one of the ways to do that while you're still working on your corporate job or whatever, because I know so many of my students just want to leave that corporate job and, and do this full time. And it's completely doable and feasible. And there's a step-by-step -step method for doing it. And it means staying disciplined. It means living like you don't have a job and taking the current income that you have and putting it towards your nest egg. And these are painful things that you have to do, but your dream is worth it. And that's what I mean by making a plan to turn it into reality you have to wake up to the fact that you might have to do some really hard things to get your business going the way you want it to go and to make your dream a reality. And it's so worth it. It's so worth it because the freedom and independence and joy that comes from being a creative entrepreneur is unmatched. I can take a vacation when I want. I can homeschool my kid. I, I don't have to worry about um, the team I'm working with because it's me. I don't have to worry about odd personalities. I don't have to worry about answering to a boss. You know, there's so many benefits to it, but it means being motivated. It means being self-disciplined and it means planning. So take your dream, make a plan, turn it into reality. Woo. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that, I mean, first of all, thank you for sharing you know, a lot of us, of course, we compare ourselves to the people that we see that we, you know, that we're following or what have you. Yeah. And so, yeah. sure, it's easy to look at you now and say, you know, that you just went straight there. Uh, yeah. And of course, it's that iceberg you know, analogy. Have you heard what, you know what I'm saying? With the iceberg, you only see the tip and at the bottom, there's all this work. Yeah, that's right. And, and so it's how do, you know, how do we motivate and encourage people to get from wherever meeting them wherever they are to you know where they want to be because I will you know and I know you talk a lot about this you know with your community and students like that is the dream for some people but doesn't have to be yeah. for everybody and so yeah. it's also being real with what are your dreams and it, I mean what what do you tell people who just want to do things part time in terms of like, do you have to, do people have an inner critic with regard to, oh, I should want to do this full time, you know, whatever the genre of photography it is, it, so you know, what's that? <laughs> okay. 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 First of all, um, you can run a business any way you want that's the joy of it. It's your choice. Yep. And if you want to keep your corporate job and just do this part-time, why the hell not? If you want to sell digital only, why the hell not? If you want to be IPS in person sales and sell product, why the hell not? I just preach to be profitable, to, to, to like stand up for your worth, stand up for your skill set. And stand up for the work and the training that you've invested in yourself, that it's worth something. 
And, you know, I even believe that there's a path, you know, cause this is such, it's such a great career for like moms. It's such a great career to, when you have little kids to, to come into digital photography and start off quote as a shoot and burner, who cares? I mean, as long as you're profitable and charging enough for it, I don't care what product you sell to your clients. And that's an easy way to go about it right now because you can just photograph and then provide the files. And that's what a lot of customers want. It's a booming business. There's pros and cons, of course, but if you do it right in the beginning, then when the kids are grown and older or going, you know, you can transition to a different business model relatively easily if you've done it right in the beginning. Now, if you're undercharging and not showing your worth, and then you try later to, to go back and go, okay, I'm this price now, you're going to have trouble. But if you start right and grow into, and again, it's about having that dream and making that plan and turning it to reality and step mapping it out creating that step-by-step -step process. And then when your kids are in school, that's when you've made some money, you've saved, you can get yourself a studio, you can start doing product, you can grow into what you wanna be. It doesn't have to be instant right away, I have to be full-time. No, grow into it. But again, have the foresight to step back, see the 40,000 foot picture and make a plan that's step-by-step. -step. And when you do that, you'll know you're on track. You'll know you're making the right decisions. You can, you know, veer off if you need to, but ultimately you know where you're going. And that is such a gift. And it's such a, to feel focused and clear is one of the greatest powers you can give yourself as an entrepreneur. So get that clarity. It's so important. I, I also, I mean, I really appreciate the, you know, the, like you said, this knowing that it's step-by-step knowing that there's room for growth, but also that knowing that the value and profitability part is so important, whatever level you're at. Uh, and, yeah. and, and that's how it's going to, that's how you're going to save. That's how you're going to be able to reinvest in all of those things. What do you hear is the, the hardest aspect of that for people? It, it, it in the value section. Oh, it's just mindset. It's, yeah. it's money blocks. It's mindset. Uh, it's accepting money for your art. I mean, think about it. It's hard for even me. I mean, I have somebody sitting here at my table going through a sales session and, you know, I had an $11,000 sale last year and I'm sitting here going, Oh my God, I got to charge this card for this much money. You just like get this like, lump in your throat and like you want to vomit in your mouth a little bit, you know, and it's, it's everybody has their quote number, the number that makes them want to puke a little, you know, and, and that number, you have to get through the whole puke factor and, and recognize that you're going to have that feeling. And the reason is, is because we as creatives put our heart and soul into our work. I mean, really, if I create an image for you, I am literally pouring all of my love and light and energy into that image. And when I ask you to pay for it, what, I'm, what am I asking you to do, according to George? To pay for me. I'm asking you to pay for my heart, my light. Is it worth it? That is a huge self-esteem killer right there. And so if you have that puke factor number, in your head and someone has to pay that for your worth, it becomes incredibly difficult <laughs> to accept that amount of money. I mean, to me, it was 11,000. What's your number? You know, and, and you have to get over that and, and learn to realize that people who are willing to spend money with you are willing to spend money for a reason. And it's not necessarily your heart and your light. It's the service you provide. It's the gain, the emotional gain they're going to get from the process, the printed product, the design, whatever it may be that you're producing for them, they are gaining benefit from that that is worth that price to them. And then of course, it's a matter of going out and finding those people who, who see that. And of course that comes down to branding and your uniqueness, your authenticity. I mean, there's a whole, we could talk about this forever. But the point is, is that that puke number, <laughs> as I like to call it, needs to grow. And, and it's up to you to make that, to put commas in that number. You know what I mean? 
Well, that that was my thought was if your puke number, you know, was 11,000, what was it when you started? Oh, good question. It was like 300. I remember when I first started, I was doing online sales because back then we we were just getting into digital. So people were still, consumers were still hung up on the, you know, how much is an 8 by 10 phone call? You know, that's what they would ask you. Now it's how much is your digitals? So I would sell prints online, which was like a huge mistake. But of course, we all make the mistakes we make when we are starting out. And I got a $300 sale and I was like, yahoo! And I didn't have to see them because it was all online. So it wasn't as hard. But then I switched to in-person sales and got ProSelect. And my first sale using ProSelect was $1,800. Oh, my word. We had a party in our head on that one. That was like George reunion, no masks. You know, that was bad. <laughs> but I did it. And I just swallowed that puke right back down into my stomach. It was kind of gross, but I did it. And the next sale was like 2100 The next sale was like 17 I forget the exact numbers. But I was in that four-figure mark like consistently after that. And you just kind of get used to it. You know, the puke doesn't come up anymore. But then the number begins to get bigger and bigger. And then you realize you kind of want the puke in your mouth because it's amazing to make money. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, hey, but it's, keeping it real. It's, it's no, but it, going back to keeping it real. Yes, thank you, appreciate it, and and uh, lovely visuals. Sorry, you um, might no, 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 not at all, not at all. Uh, but Tony Thomas is saying awesome, Alma Nasser, brilliant, love this, uh, hey, and it and it's it is just that again, step by step in whatever. If it's your puke factor, you know, step by step. <laughs> And again, being okay with the growth. Like I can also remember when I, you know, first started trying to do, um, you know, with clients doing family photography and, and asking somebody for $150 and, and, and being like, oh, there, that's a lot to ask for. Now that seems ridiculous. <laughs> right? <laughs> totally. like, how, how could I think that $150 you know, what for like giving them it's all perspective, many images, yeah. you know, all, yeah. all of that. Um, and, and granted, you know, you've got to again meet your prices where you are too, uh, or, and where you want to be. But, um, yeah, I know. I just think, I think that it, I can distinctly remember the moment where I realized that people were coming to me for a service for something that they couldn't do on their own. Me too. Can you talk to me about that and what that meant for you in shifting your, again, it's mindset, shifting your mindset in that, especially when it's the higher price clients, they're looking to you for your expertise. They're they not are. trying to do it themselves. Whereas we're like, oh, they could just do it themselves for ten dollars, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Well, not, Talk to me, me more about that. For me, it's um, I've really learned over the years that clients won't buy from you unless they trust you. Yep. And to spend, you know, four or five figures with you, it requires an enormous amount of trust. And so I think that was a big light bulb moment for me when I realized my clients trusted me deeply, deeply, to provide for them, and that was such an exhilarating feeling because then I started trusting myself that I could do this. And there is nothing like, I mean, that $11,000 sale, let me tell you, when they left, I screamed in my studio. Yes! You know, like doing the little happy dance. I think I danced for 10 minutes straight. Blair Taylor Swift, you know, shake it off, shake it off, baby. It felt so dang good. And then you start to realize, wow, I can do this. Like, I have value and like, I can make a living doing this thing I love. And then you start to go, okay, how can I grow? How can I serve my people better, my clients, and in turn grow and become more unique and branded and a beautiful, well together, put well together business. And then you start, of course, putting all those pieces in place and you start zooming out and seeing that big picture more and more and more and perfecting and refining all the little parts of your business. And you become really proud of your baby because you've birthed it. I mean, you've literally, you know, taken your lower lip and pulled it over your head and gave birth to this business. 
And there is nothing more self-confidence building and your mindset does begin to shift almost naturally as you start to grow and bring in clients. Um, and, but in the beginning, it's a lot of faith. It's a lot of trusting that you're doing the right thing. I always encourage people to find mentors, find people who've been through it, who are willing to share with you openly, freely and openly, both all their ups and all their downs. Um, because that's where you learn the most from. And, you know, I made a ton of mistakes. And now, of course, I love helping women not make those same mistakes and to see it. And I think that's the hardest part is to see what it could become. And then, of course, seeing the path to get there. Um, and that's how do you separate? How do you separate yourself from your mistakes? It's kind of going back to that separating oh. George from you. But how do you separate, like, can you give us an example of one of your bigger mistakes and how you realize like, oh, that was an experience that I made that mistake versus like, that is who I am. Oh, I can tell you one. Um, I can tell you lots. <laughs> it's, it's hard at first. Um, it's, it's really tough. And a lot of that started in broadcasting where I would screw up and make mistakes or not get the story or get berated by my boss or, you know, the competition got it and I didn't, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but then as I got into photography, it was more about mistakes I had made with clients, things I didn't do right. And there's a difference between a mistake that you know you're making and one that you just need to learn from. Um, one big one was I made a bunch of holiday cards for a client. It was eight boxes of holiday cards. And, you know, that's a lot of money. Like, you don't make any money on holiday cards. They're, like, such a high cost of good. And at the time, that was all she had bought because I didn't know how to run my business properly. And I let her just buy cards, which is a huge, huge mistake, number one. But number two, I let her proof them or approve them on her computer. And she had seen the card here in my studio because I was doing IPS at the time. But then I gave her the final proof via email. And of course, her monitor was not color calibrated. And so when she got the card, she compared it, held it up to the monitor at her house. And the color was way different. Oh, and she was so upset. She was an older lady and uh, she was so mad at me. She was like, I can't send these out. This is a disgrace. I mean, she literally called me every name in the book. And um, I didn't replace the cards and I should have. So the first mistake was I... I didn't know about the whole color calibration thing. So that was like, okay, fool me once, shame on, you know, I can fix it. And that's just a lesson I can learn and never do it again in the future. And one that you can kind of wash under the bridge. But when I have a mistake where I should have replaced those cards at my expense, and I didn't because she had approved them here in the studio. And I used that as the, you know, caveat of, oh, well, you signed for them. And I was kind of a hard ass and I was like, you know, sticking to my policies more than I should have. And I regret that now. Other things, same thing. I had another client. Oh my gosh. We'll call, we'll call. Yeah. I'm not going to say her name. That's not right. But anyway, challenging children, tough shoot, unhappy from the start, just berated me, called me horrible. I had no talent and, you know, blah, blah, blah. blah. And it's like, I, I ended up refunding her, her entire amount and she got everything for free cards canvas files everything and uh, you know looking back i you know we had had kind of a yelling match on the phone <laughs> oh yeah not don't do that it's not it's not a good idea uh, and i you know you feel guilty about those things later so it's the things where recognizing your mistakes as far as whether or not they affect your self esteem really goes down to can i learn from this and am i learning from it and if you know, you're doing a behavior that you wouldn't like to see in someone else, then chances are that's a mistake you can kind of give yourself a hard time over. But from there, it's, okay, fix it. You screwed up. Take that humble pill and fix it. And only then, you know, it's one thing to say you're sorry. It's another thing to make it right. And I tell my son that all the time. And I truly believe that in business. And sometimes it's really hard to make it right. You can't. You literally just have to say, what can I do? And there are times when people will take advantage of you and they'll want you to, you know, give them everything and a refund or whatever. Just swallow it and do it. 
because you'll feel like you took the high road um, after that and you'll grow your confidence in doing such. Does that, am I answering this question? I feel like yes. I'm wondering. No, no abs- absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, just the, again, coming back to, I know you talk a lot about customer service, you know, with regard to being a core tenant of, of one's business, whatever business you're in. Yeah. Uh, and, and so those are hard lessons to learn because it's, again, you equate making a mistake with, you know, there's something wrong with me or, and versus that, like, and I'm always going to make that mistake or whatever it is versus learning from it. And, and the, and, and acknowledging that there was a reason perhaps that you needed to learn that lesson. Well, and the other Uh, thing too, is that failure sometimes puts you on a better path. Yes. You know, when you make a mistake and you screw up, you fail at something, chances are that was the universe saying to you, change your path, go in a different direction. It could be tiny little shift and it could be huge, you know, career change, whatever. The point is, is you have to look at failure as just simply pushing you on a different path, not telling you you're awful. And I think that that's where I've learned to recognize failure. It sucks. I mean, failure sucks, you know, but if you can kind of look at it and take joy in it a little bit, I know that seems really crazy, but when you've screwed up, just kind of appreciate it for the fact that it's trying to tell you something. You know, and, and when you do that and you find, try to find that silver lining, you try to find the path it set you on, again, it makes it not so self-defeating. And that, I mean, I think that's so important and, and something that I hear from so many people who, you know, who are, have gotten to the stage that you have in their business or life or what have you, uh, is, is turning that failure mistakes into opportunity Yeah. and, and coming back around, it's often just a mindset, uh, and then acting upon, like you said, you're acting upon your plans, your dreams, all of it. Everyone who has run a successful business has failed multiple times. Everyone. You can't do this without failing. Right. Like it's impossible. Cause then you're not actually doing anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right? I, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, I know again, in your, you know, working with people to establish their business and establish what they stand for, what their values are and, you know, letting people know that in the way that they do. One of the things that you write on your website is it is my heartbeat to encourage you in your role as a creative visionary. And again, you've, you've clearly, I mean, you do, you serve clients and you serve you know, who are the, your families and, and, and then you serve your students. Mm-hmm. So talk to me about what it means for people to see themselves as a creative visionary. Well, I think both parents, families, and entrepreneurs are creative visionaries, you know, and I think that's, people ask me that, you know, what does that mean for a client, for a family? Well, my families who come to me, they want something tangible. They want tangible art. They visualize or have a vision for celebrating their family. And I'm sorry, but their family is their creation. And, and they started their family with that vision of creating something beautiful, of love, of connection, of growing together and raising children. That's all being a creative visionary. And so it is my heartbeat to help families um, go, I don't want to say capture those moments because it's cheesy. It's not, that's not what I mean. I want to help families go back to those feelings, those feelings of creation, that feeling of when my child was, you know, four and saying, you know, hop colder instead of cup holder. You know, I, that to me is, Going back to those emotions is what my purpose is for my clients. Now, for my students, it's a little bit more self-explanatory because we are creative visionaries. We have a dream and a vision to create with our cameras, with light. And we can serve beautifully families, seniors, commercial brands to help them visualize their own selves, whether that be a brand voice, whether that be a family's voice, whether that be you know, a high school senior's journey into adulthood, they have a voice 
and they're on a path. And it's our job as creative visionaries to help them see their own vision and to help them, you know, get through life with that timestamp, if that makes sense. The timestamp on who they are, what they do, and what their path is in their journey in this thing called life. It's beautiful. And it's interesting because me being a photographer and a creative, I read, you know, it's my heartbeat to encourage you in your role as the creative visionary, you know, as for the photographers, but spinning that around to encouraging people to understand that anybody can be or is a creative visionary because we're creating, we're creating a vision (laughs) for our lives. We are. And, and, and everybody grows up wanting to do or be something in their lives. And that may shift and change. Everybody's purpose on this planet is to learn and grow and give of ourselves to the earth, to the people, to humanity, to wildlife, whatever it may be. That is your life's creative vision. And you know, as photographers, we have a big, strong role to play there because we get to put that visualization into concrete, tangible reality. Does that make sense? And that gift is something that we, you know, shouldn't take lightly. And it's what inspires me daily. And the fact that I can not only do it with my clients, but also help others do that for others, that is my contribution to the planet you know, and if I can leave that legacy, God, I've even in just a tiny way with a few people, I can go to the gates of pearly heaven and say, Hey, I did something. And that feels really good. It feels really good. And let me tell you, when you have a health crisis or something weird in your life, a divorce, whatever it may be, you're, you know, I used to be all about the money and the status and the And now it's like, God, it's so different. It's, it's that desire to just giving is so much easier than getting giving is so much more fun (laughs) than getting and giving myself as much as I can. Um, and having that trust that people are ultimately good is so liberating. Um, and, and I'm wandering off on a tangent again, but anyway, I just encourage everyone to get, you know, obviously you need to be paid your worth and what you do, but remember that ultimately your purpose is to live your life lovely, but also provide something to the planet, I guess is what I'm saying. Provide something to humanity. And we as photographers have a, have a great chance, a great opportunity to do that. Julia, uh, uh, not a tangent beautiful way to wrap up this conversation (laughs) in a bow for people. Thank you. Uh, Just what a great way to kick off the year. So appreciative to have you on our podcast. We are photographers on creative live, of course. Um, how many years, how many years has it been since your first creative live? Oh my gosh. I think it was 2012 was my first photo week. Oh my gosh. And then Eight I years. did the pricing and pricing and sales class in 2013, the beginning of 2013. And I, what do I have? 13 classes, 14 classes, something like something that. Like that. I, it's a lot. I, <laughs> we've had Things a have lot changed of so much times. now though. I mean, I've done yeah. the, the education has changed so much and IPS and sales and marketing. Like there's so many different methods now. Um, and you know, those classes, you know, they, they're great, but they're, they're starting point, but there's so much more out there, you know, keep learning, keep learning, keep learning, always hashtag always learning. Uh, Speaking (laughs) of Julia, where can people be sure to find you, follow you? Uh, There's so many uh, different ways to continue to be inspired by you and learn. Let people know all the places. Oh, I would love that. Well, first of all, Focus and Facets podcast is uh, one place. You can go to 5ccollective.com. That is our business mastermind membership. Um, which we've actually opened for like 48 hours right now for this in honor of this podcast. And then you can find me on Instagram, Julia Kelleher, Facebook. Of course, I have a free Facebook group uh, called uh, photography business by design, designing a business that's beautiful and lovely. And um, I just joined clubhouse. 
Have you joined that new social media I platform? I have not. I haven't. I, tell, tell me how it's going for you. It's actually, I start, I went in there today for the first time and I'm kind of crushing on it. It's, uh, I can send you my invite, Kenna, if okay, you want. Okay, please do. I haven't, I haven't been invited yet. So I only get one, so I'll give it to you. I know. like. So. And it, But it's like audio rooms. Like you can go into a room and like listen to people talk about things. And already I'm seeing like Audrey Willard's on there with some amazing oh, conversations. Cool. It's not just, just fun. It's just interesting, but who knows? You know how these things go. Who knows if they'll actually launch off. But uh, yeah, so you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. Uh, not super active on Twitter. I do have an account there, but um, yeah, that's probably the best place to find me. And of course, 5ccollective.com and the Focus and Facets podcast, which you can find on Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for letting me cross promote. I appreciate yeah. it. Sounds like you've said that before. Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. Spotify. <laughs> Well, people always want uh, me to say my tagline from from broadcasting. I'll go, Julia Radlick, live in Bend, K2 News. <laughs> that was my maiden name. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Julia, thank you so much. Again, everybody can find those links in the show notes as well. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you. I want to give a few more shout outs before we sign off because there have been a ton of comments coming Yay, in. I want to hear them. Um, we have uh, Lucia Griffin. So glad I caught this live. Great to see you both. Love your work, Julia, and your teaching. Yasmin saying, I stumbled on this talk and I'm so grateful. What a beautiful, honest soul, Julia. Such an affirming com uh, conversation. Uh, thank you so much. We've got Lynn in Esparto, California, um, going on and on and on. Uh, so th again, oh, special shout out to Joan Williams, uh, who says, Joan! wow, two of my favorite Hi, people. Joan! And, uh, and Julia and Joan holds a, a special place in my heart. She came to Africa with me on one of my tours. Oh so. my gosh. Well, she's been at my yes. creative life classes. Love you, Joan. Yes. Hope you're doing good, honey. Um, <laughs> Once again, everybody, uh, this has been another episode of We Are Photographers. Uh, the original uh, stream is a live stream here on creativelive.com slash TV. You can check out everything that is coming up, uh, whether that's the We Are Photographers podcast or the Chase Jarvis live show and many other things here on Creative Live. Uh, we love seeing you, connecting with you. You can always uh, send me a message if you want to suggest somebody else to be here um, on the podcast. And once again, you can subscribe, rate, and review, whether that's on Apple, Stitcher, or Spotify. <laughs> and, or Spotify. <laughs> Love it. Truly, um, truly, I know it is for Julia and it is for myself and all of us here on Creative Live. It is an honor to serve you all and it is an honor to have you as part of our community and we look forward to a beautiful year ahead with all of you. So happy 2021, everybody. And thank you again to Julia Kelleher. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. If you're feeling isolated and looking for creative connection, try tuning into creativelive.com slash TV. That's where we've got a 24 seven live stream from the kitchen counters. I can do that back lit shot that I really like to do. From the studios and living rooms of many of the world's top creators where we're doing musical performances, Q and A's, cooking shows, virtual book tour events, drawing, spoken word poetry, and more. Life passed me by waiting for an invitation when the world is greater than my nation or my occupation. Be someone you've never been. You feel all that adrenaline, it's medicine. It actually helps me feel like my days are more purposeful. I hope that out of this deep pain will come some collective growth. Dive into Creative Live TV today. Hey guys, what's up? It's Chase Jarvis, founder and CEO of Creative Live. You all know that we have more than 2,000 classes and more than 10,000 hours of learning, inspirational, 
and motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. You've told us that you're busy and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to finish. So essentially we're now giving you a shortened highlight version of our top Creative Live classes. You can always dive into the full class with five, 10 or 15 hours of great content. But now if you're just looking to focus on a few of the highlights or wanna be able to skip quickly to something that really interests you, you can now get a shortened fast class version of that class. We're also thinking this might be able to help you explore a new craft and save time while doing it. This is a great tool to curate your learning experience to help create the life that you seek. So you're probably thinking, great, how do I access this new experience on Creative Live? That's easy. All you have to do is be a subscriber to the Creator Pass and then all this is yours.